Good morning. So also now the technical stuff is done. Um, uh, welcome to the session. Um, I have the honor to uh, represent the psychologist's view and I kind of uh, put together some interesting theories and concepts from a very kind of exotic field. It's called environmental psychology or sometimes called architectural psychology. Uh, it's a small, very small field. It created a lot of, uh, like a big body of knowledge. Um, and, but although be very helpful for, for design of spaces, you can kind of see it as like UX design for the, for the built environment. Um, it's actually kind of largely unknown and there are only a few people doing it. I don't know why, but that's how it is. Um, so I kind of like to give you or be a thought starter from the uh, scientific view and some applications that can be done with it. So let's start with some fun facts. Did you know that people like these kinds of environments, environments the most? It's because uh, they remind us to uh, an environment that used to be um, perfect for survival, the savanna. Uh, so it can be overlooked very, uh, very easily, but also offers enough hiding spaces and it's flat enough to walk on it comfortably. Did you know that crime rates in, uh, are higher in, in areas with higher buildings? It's of course that these areas have more traffic, there are more people, there's more opportunity for crime, but also the height by itself uh, takes away the feeling of responsibility for others. Um, and this creates a feeling of anonymity uh, which allows offenders to do their thing without uh, being or expected to be intervened. Did you know that people in a hospital get well faster when they have a room with a view out on nature? That's because nature has a restorative, like a calming uh, effect on people. Uh, and also by people uh, who are closer to the end of a hospital room also get uh, well faster because the traffic by nurses, by visitors, by, by doctors at the beginning of the room seem to impose some stress. So next time make sure you get the room or the, the, the bed with a view by the window. So all of this is called uh, like um, psychology or applied psychology. So let's keep in mind what psychology is. We all have a notion about that, but the official, more or less official definition, it's the science of how people experience the world, how they think and feel about it, and how they behave in it. And uh, environmental psychology is all of the above, but mediated by the, by the environment, whether built or natural. So it's a fairly young discipline. It started in the 1960s. Um, as I said, it created lots of research and a lot of insight, but it's also a way of application. And that's why the, the name it goes by in, in the US is called environmental design. Um, so how does it differ from other perspectives? Because despite having the same name, it is a very, um, it's very different from, from uh, like regular psychology but also offers in a way like a philosophical view on the world on the outside. So first of all, it's a very, or in, in, in nature, it's a very systemic view. So environmental uh, psychology um, takes more, much more into, the, into account than just the, the individual. Um, here we have an individual. So it also takes into account, of course, as I said, the physical environment and also the tasks, the challenges this physical environment uh, proposes or opposes to the, to the little guy here. Um, for in this case, it's, we have an intersection that's hard to overlook. Let's give him a car so he can actually um, uh, take up that challenge. So phys the person, physical uh, world is one thing. Next thing is our, uh, our cultural environment that is also part of this uh, systemic view. And this is represented, for example, by these signs like the uh, the walkway, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a cultural agreed sign for here you can cross very uh, comfortably in a safe way. And finally, environmental psychology takes into account the uh, uh, other people's perspective, like the social perspective, and that's represented by these people who want to cross. And so there is also some interaction between this person and them, eye contact, understanding what they do. So we have three environments. We have the physical environment, we have the cultural environment, and we have the social environment, and all of this built together that uh, systemic view of environmental psychology. Um, <clears throat> it deals with various topics. Just a quick overview of what it could do. It's about aesthetics. How do you create pleasing buildings, pleasing parks, uh, or how to avoid 
making ugly stuff. Um, it's about the use of space. Um, how do you invite people actually to, to take up a space? Uh, a very good example, I think, no, a very bad example, I think is Hamburg. You just mentioned the, the waterway in Berlin, but in Hamburg, uh, also at the River Elbe, they created a new uh, quarter. The, um, it's close to where the, uh, where the big, uh, the new concert hall is. And um, I was involved in that, in that project, and the idea was like to create a space that everyone takes up and uses, but it's empty land. It's, it doesn't really um, invite people to, uh, to really hang out there. We're going to see in a, in a minute why this is the case. Um, it's about interaction. Environment creates an interaction. You can make a co-creative space where people uh, are invited to interact, or you can create a, an environment where people are rather like walking past each other. Uh, territoriality plays a big role. Humans have territories like animals. Uh, it's about wayfinding, for example, how to, how to uh, represent a, a space in your mind and how to how to walk around or find your way in a in a building or in a in a space and it does so on all different kinds of scales so it could be on the on the space of the of the interior design think of think of residential areas office spaces uh, commercial environment it does so on the level of buildings usually institutional buildings like nursing homes uh, hospitals or even prisons actually there are people who work in that area. Um, public spaces, um, making spaces where people hang out or larger land like the one I mentioned in Hamburg or uh, urban planning on that scale. So that's a quick roundup on the, on the, on the science here. Um, I'd like to give you some uh, inspiring thoughts, inspiring theories uh, and concepts uh, that people came up with in the last 60 years. Some seem very funky, but they all have a very interesting notion to it at, to look at the world. So um, let's start with environmental psychology. Um, the way we behave is the result of the conditions our ancestors were living in. Humans have been around for about 2 million years, uh, and only in the recent couple of 10,000 years, conditions changed dramatically. So we have maybe like 1.9 million years of uh, uh, or time to adapt to these very stable conditions, actually. So an adaptation not only took place in biology, but also in psychology, like how we behave, how we experience things. Um, so our behavior is a great deal influenced by very old patterns, actually, uh, that are hard to, hard to get out. Think hunting, think gathering, think of the fear of the saber-toothed tiger. Um, so an application of that might be, or an example, humans have the tendency to find a place uh, where, they, um, where they can overlook the savanna, but still uh, have their back covered. That's why in restaurants or in bars or wherever you look, people first fill up those seats with their back to the wall. No one likes to sit in the middle. And so that's coming from our ancestral uh, uh, times or instincts in a way. So when you design spaces, you need to consider our animal behavior. Next uh, theory or concept is territory, territoriality. Humans have territories like animals. Um, they come with a perceived ownership. Um, people demonstrate that they have control over a physical space and others do actually acknowledge it, usually at least. Um, so they regulate um, who has access and defines the interaction, actually what happens there. There are three kinds, three levels of territories. There's primary territory, that's the, that's the bedroom or your apartment. There are secondary territories that is like the family room or maybe the staircase in your building, uh, in your apartment building. And there are public territories like the beach chair or so. And according to the territory, people choose diff different markers um, to mark it that it's their own. At home, it's pictures. They also have a symbolic content. You can read a lot from how people um, design their, their homes, their spaces. And they can be also uh, like, you know, the good old beach towel or so you put on a chair, especially we Germans are known for that. Um, and they have different reactions towards intrusion. At home, you call the police. Uh, at the beach chair, if someone takes your space, you maybe just go away. Um, so all of this has a strong effect on, on behavior, and you should consider actually that when, when you design spaces. Here's an application of that. It's called, it's another concept actually called defensible space. 
Um, it's, a, it's a mechanism or it's design principles to, uh, to deter crime in residential areas. Um, you make a space defensible by showing that it belongs to someone. You kind of put these markers in there. Uh, in German, we say Gartenzwerk, uh, for example. Um, you can design it in a way that people see what is happening there, other people outside, so make it kind of visible or open up visible accesses to, uh, to other parts. And you can, uh, you can you, by keeping it well groomed, you also show off that someone is really taking care and is responsible for that space. Um, so consider the subtle language of territoriality. It happens everywhere. It's like once you open up the view, you're going to notice it really everywhere. Um, another notion actually is, um, it goes back to uh, Gestalt psychology from the 1940s. Um, um, it's very funky but interesting. So to understand behavior, you need to consider the current um, like uh, active factors within a person, their mood, their state, their, uh, their goals, and so on. But you also need to consider outside factors. So it's actually both. And these two create like a force field. Uh, Levine, that guy, kind of really described the gravitational uh, field. Um, the human environment uh, or objects in that, uh, or situations actually in that environment, they exert a way of gravitation and they pull people towards a certain situation or object but they can also have negative gravitation that push people away. There are also hurdles. Um, sounds very abstract, but a good application or a way of seeing it, um, maybe you guys know, know this one. It's called the Fun Theory by Volkswagen of Sweden. It was a, a, a fun way of making people use stairs uh, instead of the, um, the moving uh, stairs uh, because that is, they make sounds like a, like a piano. But um, not all people actually use it. Only the people who are in a playful mood or have a playful character jump on these. The others still use the running stairs. So that is just an, uh, an, a way of like looking at that, that you need both <coughs> understand very much um, how, how people, what, what, what state they are in, what is on their mind actually if you create spaces that need to be or that want to be used. Another interesting theory is called, or it's, it's called the affordances. Um, objects in the environment have an interesting or an inherent meaning that can be easily read or picked up by, by the observers. So objects uh, make offers to the viewer to be used in a certain way. Um, like horizontal surfaces uh, invite you to walk on it or sit on it. Um, a soft surface invites you to lie on it. A fire maybe invites you to heat yourself up. So what is special about that theory is that it looks at environments and objects um, as having characteristics that invite you to do something rather than that behavior is coming out from, from the person. And here's also an application. These affordances became famous by, by product designer Donald Norman in his book, The Design of Everyday Things. Um, so this door clearly invites you from one side to push, to open, and to pull from the other side. And sometimes you see designs that are contrary to these affordances, and then people are like, how do I do with this? Um, especially my favorite is um, uh, faucets in hotels. Uh, it's sometimes they have very funky designs, and you don't need to, don't, you don't need to how to operate your shower. So when you design for certain use, consider the offer objects naturally make. Um, last theory is by Roger Barker. Um, it's the social situation determines, uh, uh, determines behavior. For example, you will observe, observe the same behavior in a classroom or on a playground or in a cinema. Everyone is facing the same direction. Everyone's inside there for maybe two hours. People are only whispering. When you go out within the two hours, you bend down. So, these environment or these behavior settings, they have different characteristics like the number of participants or their duration or the roles that take in, play, in there, the activities. Um, and Barker speaks of uh, standing patterns of behavior. And even if you are not adhering to these standard patterns, um, people in the situation might uh, say like, Psh! or so. So they kind of um, um, intervene and keep up that standing pattern of behavior. Um, 
A practical example, uh, one of my clients, Swisscom, they created uh, like in their work area a silent room or silent work area, and, but people did not really keep silence there. And only after we made it look like a library, people really recognized that behavior situation, uh, behavior setting, and kept the silent. So when you design spaces, you can make use of analogies of known situations um, with existing standard patterns of behavior. Just a very quick round for inspiration, what can be done with all these principles. For example, you can, uh, if you know how people represent space in their minds, uh, how they find their way, you can help uh, people to understand an airport better and help them to, uh, to, to find their way quicker, uh, reduce stress by that, just by, by placing signs at the right way. Um, you can create office spaces, uh, which I sometimes do, um, which uh, an office can be seen like a tool. It's like it has a, as a user experience like any other tool. Um, and by understanding what really needs to happen there, you can create the perfect tool that supports what people need to do to make them happy, but also to support company goals like becoming more innovative or more efficient and so on. So that's uh, actually a photo from uh, Swisscom uh, Innovation Department in Bern and they created all different kinds of uh, tools and different spaces in there uh, to support these uh, innovation activities there as a uh, provider, service provider. Also, design has a great influence what, uh, whether people adopt the place uh, and how they use it. And some public spaces are heavily used, like the Spanish stairs in Rome, and to that my, my favorite negative example in, um, in, in Hamburg does not support it. And here's a little, uh, uh, like just a minute from a movie um, from the 70s. It's about public spaces, how people use it, how people adopt it. Big times, the front left is the most heavily used, especially by younger people who tend to the front. These elegantly simple steps are a very important feature. They're low and they're easy. They're easy to go up and down. They're also easy to sit on. And the corner has a right angle that's fine for groups. But there's a problem. The corners of the steps are precisely where the main flow of people to and from the buildings can be found. Yet this is where people like to stand and to sit and to block the track. There are usually a few feet here and there for passage, and though sometimes it does get a little difficult, you have to pick your way very carefully. But it's a friendly kind of congestion, and later things do clear up a bit. So that's how you look at public spaces, for example, and the uh, adoption. And you can, of course, work with these principles to make places be adopted uh, more by people. Another field of application is, uh, for example, residential environments, creating quality of life. Uh, the former company I worked for, the people for places and spaces, so we have spaces and places in there, actually. Um, they created the living streets in Christchurch in New Zealand, and it's about calming a residential area in a way that not only the traffic goes out, but that people adopt these spaces, hang out, and make it their own. It also increases the social life of people. Um, so quality of life is also an adoption. Let me quickly sum it up. So, some helpful hints. Consider our animal behavior. Consider the subtle language of spatial ownership, territoriality. Consider the current mental state of people you design for. Mental state not being as healthy, but unhealthy, but what, they, what is on their mind, actually. Consider the offers of use objects naturally make. And finally, make use of analogies of known situation with existing behavior patterns. So that is the little roundup from the science of psychology. Thank you very much.